Hi, my name is Josh Shell, host of the Let's Start a Cult podcast, the only podcast that calls its audience Fred. That's right. I did a Twitter poll a few weeks ago to find out what I should call my audience, and you wonderful people chose Fred. Not plural, just Fred. So, <laughs> welcome, Fred. <laughs> now, with that out of the way, let me introduce to you my guests this week. They are both hosts of the wonderful Terrible People Doing Terrible Things podcast, a podcast that discusses and dissects the terrible people throughout history and presents it in a hilarious and thought-provoking conversation. From Mother Teresa to Henry Ford, they've got you covered with the best of the worst in humanity. Please welcome to the family, Amanda and Laura. How are you guys doing today? Hi, we're doing good. Hi, I am also well. Now, there are a lot of terrible people currently and in, in history. Who is <laughs> who's a person you can't wait to do an episode on? Um, I want to do John Wayne Gacy because somebody did mention us dressing up like clowns and we both like to uh, do cosplay and stuff. So I think that would be a fun one. It'll be a fun episode. Yeah, we record the video for the episodes. How about you, Amanda? Oh, gosh. I want to cover something kind of from my home state. There was this woman that I think almost had like a baby farm kind of situation where she was... (laughs) And then murdering the kids. So I was like, oh, okay. good, good job, Tennessee. <laughs> I heard about that, actually. Yeah. yeah. Was it a long time ago? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She like she did it for like the money she got from uh, getting Social Security for the kids or whatever. Interesting. Lovely, lovely woman. <laughs> well, that is definitely on brand with your podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very. <laughs> Speaking on sticking on brand, uh, I wanted to have you guys on for this episode because it, I chose a... Uh, a cult with pretty terrible people and they do pretty terrible things. So I figured it was perfect for you guys. Okay. Because on today's episode, we will be focusing on the Matamoros cult, an organization that consisted of Mexico's most powerful drug cartels. <gasps> okay. I think I've heard of some of this. In a desperate bid for protection and security, its members turned to the devil and black magic, murdering, mutilating, and sacrificing humans. Yes. Oh. So you've heard of the, the Matamoros cult before? Just a little bit because I I think I've also been looking up like satanic ritual abuse, um, <laughs> killings, you know, for other people to cover and everything. So I think I kind of glanced at one of those and I was like, ooh, are they still operating? Because I don't want to be murdered by them. But <laughs> You are safe. Don't worry. They're uh, spoilers. They're not around ah, anymore. Okay, good. But, uh... <laughs> well, that's good at least. I haven't heard of this one before. So this is a new one for me. Perfect. It'll be an interesting tale for you then. <laughs> So we'll start with the leaders of uh, this cult and explain a little bit more about their background. On November 1st, 1962, a 15-year-old immigrant woman named Delia Aurora Gonzalez gave birth to a baby boy whom she christened Adolfo, which is very close to Adolf. And I'm not sure if that's a <laughs> foreshadowing or just poor parenting. <laughs> but I mean, looking at what we're talking about, I think it's, it's probably foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little bit of both, I think. <laughs> She had originally come to the United States from Cuba to seek a better life. Once settled in Miami, Florida, though, she found nothing but a sea of endless boyfriends and husbands. So that's uh, that's Florida for you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, can't say I disagree, but yeah. (laughs) After her first husband, Adolfo's biological father had died, Delia moved with her young son to San Juan, Puerto Rico and married another man shortly afterward. The couple had a child together, and by all accounts, the blended family was living an idyllic life. They were Catholic, with Adolfo even serving as an altar boy during Mass. However, he was also made to accompany Delia during her frequent trips to nearby Haiti, where the mother-son duo immersed themselves in Haitian Vodo, a folk religion that combined beliefs with Roman Catholicism with the traditional religion of West Africa. So, quite a (laughs) mix-up. Yeah. (laughs) I wasn't sure if there was going to be some allusion to voodoo, Haitian voodoo or anything. Yeah, Haitian voodoo is a big down. The Catholicism and the saints, how a lot of those are included in Haitian voodoo practices. That could be how it's pronounced, but it's it's spelled V-O-D-O-U. So I don't know. It may be. (laughs) It may be actually voodoo. Mm, I don't remember. Ooh, that sounds like a predecessor to voodoo. Like it sounds Ooh. like it could be like the darker cousin of just like, <laughs> like way worse. Even voodoo's already like kind of like steeped in like dark mystery and, and stuff. But for it to have like a French accent sounds. Yeah. Were there French colonies in Haiti? There are. Yeah, actually. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Haiti's very French. So yes. <laughs> that's possible. Followers of Haitian voodoo, voodoo or voodoo, whatever we're calling it, mainly worship the Iwa, 
a collection of deities whom they believe as intermediaries between the human world and the supreme creator, Bonde. And I'm going to pronounce a lot of these words wrong, so I'm, I apologize to anyone That's in this literally religion. like half of our content. We've done that so many times. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's going to be most of this episode. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> In one of their most important ceremonies, the Iwa are called to possess a certain individual through a frenzied ritual consisting of drumming, singing, and dancing. Fruit and the blood of sacrificed animals were also offered to these deities in a bid to curry favor with Bonde. This exposure to Haitian voodoo caused the young Adolfo to develop a lifelong interest in folk religion of a similar kind. After his stepfather passed away in 1972, the family returned to Miami, where Delia remarried again. Husband number three, however, was a drug dealer and a follower of the religion called Palo Mayombe, also referred to as Los Regales de Congo. Palo Mayombe originated among Central Africans who were enslaved and forced to work in the fields of Cuba. They believed that all objects, particularly sticks, were infused with the powers of the Kampungula, spirits whose power was outranked only by the supreme being, Nzambi. Kind of similar, a okay, little yeah. different, I guess. <laughs> yeah, still very spiritual, supernatural. Very interesting powers from like a higher being exactly yeah yeah yeah. central to the palo mayambe religion was the nagana nagana i'm gonna butcher a lot of this <laughs> like i said i'm telling you we do that constantly <laughs> <laughs> so the nagana was a cauldron either made of iron or clay and was believed to be inhabited by the spirits of the dead human skeletal remains were placed inside by the religion's practitioners who were also referred to as paleros along with other elements from nature, all of which were said to entice the spirits of the deceased to come into the Nagana. Okay, I wonder if this is like shamans. Is it like a shamanic? It, it does sound kind of like tied into like earth magic kind of stuff, but I think it's probably just like a different, there's so many different like iterations of, you know, faiths and everything like that that could just be like yeah. location based. Yeah, they could also probably be referred to like, pretty similarly to shamans. And I think shaman does come up here somewhere. I'm just not sure. Where. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely along those lines. So all you have to do to entice the dead to your party is throw people in a pot, <laughs> throw in some herbs and stuff. You got, a, you got yourself a nice soup. Makes for a good dead party. Yeah. Human soup. <laughs> yeah, human soup. Uh. I love it. <laughs> in an article entitled... Making Nagana, Begetting a God, Materiality and Belief in the Afro-Cuban Religion of Palomonte. What a title. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, the Nagana is the dead man's materialization, his new body, so to speak, and it allows him to regain some of the attributes specific to life, such as growth, needs, desires, and pleasures. Because it has a shape, the spirit embodied in the cauldron enables the Palero to physically enact, interact with it to talk with it, to touch it, to feed it, etc., which makes religious experience in Palo Mayambe extremely rich on a sensory level. In the minds mm. of the people following this religion, they're like they're essentially bringing back the dead uh, yeah. in their minds. It, I mean, it does sound like it's a resurrection mm. kind of ritual. Yeah, it's very much so. And and I don't know if it's more like a like a zombie thing or if it's just like a spirits. It sounds more like spirits, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not like quite necromancer level, but like... Just the level below, yeah. Yeah, just one step below necromancer, so... Necrophilia? That's all I can call it. <laughs> No, Amanda, we've talked about this. We've talked about the necrophilia. That's a different thing. <laughs> Some contemporary practitioners of Palo Mayambe make use of animal bones in lieu of human ones. However, there are still those who yearn to remain true to the religious roots digging up the remains of the dead in order to fully communicate with spirits. The practice was so widespread in Cuba that the government was forced to introduce a law that punished grave robbers and grave desecrators with a 30-year imprisonment, so, <laughs> which is ridiculous. <laughs> wow, that's a steep imprisonment for, for grave robbing. Dang. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess if all your graveyards are getting, like... Just torn just up, torn yeah. up, that's probably pretty traumatizing <laughs> for the local community. Yeah, it's kind of funny that you can get more jail time for ruining a grave of someone who's already dead rather than killing someone and getting 25 years. Oh, yeah, because like manslaughter. Yep. <laughs> do you even get, do you even get time less. for that? <laughs> yeah, involuntary manslaughter and stuff like that. <laughs> Not here. <laughs> I know what you may be thinking. You may be thinking like, well, that's Cuba. Like no first world country would do that. And 
that's where you'd be wrong because the grizzly tradition continues to this day. And according to the Miami Herald, grave robbers at three cemeteries in South Florida in 2018 had been committed by followers of Palo Mayambe. So I guess, yeah, the statement still stands. I don't know if you can call Florida a first world country, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to lose all my Florida listeners. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. What is the, right. the quote from Party Rock? It's the penis of the United States. Basically. Yeah. I mean, it looks like it too, so. They know what they did. Yeah. yeah they know. Florida knows. They know. By the time he reached his teens, Adolfo was actively participating in Palo Mayambe, even going so far as to become an apprentice to a local sorcerer. <laughs> I wonder how cool. he found this sorcerer. Was there like an ad in the newspaper for apprentices? No, he definitely has a business card that says sorcerer that he hands out at bars. It's just a local homeless man. <laughs> probably. Yeah, pro- probably. It probably is. He's like, look, I can do magic. Watch. <laughs> Watch me. Just take some of this and you'll see magic. Take these bath salts. Yeah. Yeah. Here's some peyote. Have a great time. <laughs> So he and his mother also engaged in a series of crime sprees with multiple arrests for minor offenses such as theft, vandalism, and shoplifting. The Constanzas weren't well liked by their neighbors in Miami who often complained to the authorities of dead animals being left at their doorstep every time they confronted the family. Delia was even arrested by local authorities after she was reported for harboring over 27 animals in their apartment. When the police arrived, they described the smaller residence to be smeared with blood and feces, creating a smell that was impossible to forget. That's <laughs> lovely. Uh, so I guess they're hoarding animals, not only for the rituals, but to <laughs> shit on their neighbors. <laughs> it's like you have a goat trained to command to just go shit on your neighbor. Oh, no. <laughs> they just had to keep getting more animals because they kept getting more complaints. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, blood and feces, you know, tends to... To make a very potent smell. It's not often looked over by others. Yeah. <laughs> I can't can't say for, from firsthand experience, but uh, I can imagine yeah. it wouldn't be wouldn't be great. For sure, it's probably similar to smell to the porta potties down in Florida. Oh, very true. Sitting out in the summer heat, yep, just cooking. It's probably some blood in those too. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm gonna have to look up porta potty murders. So thank you for that. <laughs> porta potty deaths. Hey, there you go. <laughs> After graduating from high school, Adolfo moved to Mexico City in 1984, where he befriended Martin Quintana, George Monte, and Omar Oria. To make money, the four men launched a business that capitalized on Adolfo's time as a sorcerer's apprentice. They sold magic spells they claimed would bring good fortune to the customers. These were cast using rituals that involved sacrificing a wide range of animals from chickens and goats to the more exotic animals like zebras and lion cubs. Where the fuck did they get the zebras? That's a good, that's a better question. We should derail this whole episode to find (laughs) out where they got the zebras there. You just come upon a zebra. Like I understand that apparently lions and tigers are everywhere in Florida. And is it Oklahoma where Tiger King is or something? Yes. Yeah, (laughs) that was Oklahoma. But zebras? Yeah. I bet they just painted horses to look like zebras and then sacrificed those. <laughs> I mean, that's definitely the cheaper way of acquiring zebras. Much cheaper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were grifting hard. Grifter. Yeah, grifting. <laughs> <laughs> this business proved to be a lucrative venture, thanks to Mexico City's residents. And it wasn't long before the partners began attracting a different sort of clientele. Rich drug dealers, hitmen, and the elite of, the, of Mexican society all of whom were enthralled by Adolfo's magic and awe-inspiring displays. He was even introduced to the city's high-ranking government authorities and powerful narcotics cartels, cementing his role as the enigmatic mystic of Mexico City. <laughs> that was so many difficult words <laughs> right together. <laughs> well, the, the alliteration, the mystic, yeah. mystic something? It, manic, it, mystic. It, I can't say, I can't, I'm not going to, you know what? I'm not going to try. Sounds like a palm, try. like a fortune teller or something. Yeah. Also, when you said Sorcerer's Apprentice, I really couldn't help but laugh because of that stupid movie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they yeah. made the Sorcerer's Apprentice. And that's just what it made me think of, of this guy, like in a basement with the brooms and stuff. There's like, a magic broom dancing around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think it's kind of telling, like he's meeting high ranking government officials. So that just kind of shows how, I don't know if you'd say corrupt Mexican governments were back in the 80s for sure. Oh, yeah. I don't know about now. I'm not going to speculate, but definitely back then they were a little bit corrupt. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it just shows you how like how magic and that kind of stuff is ingrained in Mexican society, which is kind of kind of neat. 
Oh, yeah. In that culture, for sure. But it is interesting that he's like getting introduced to like government officials <laughs> and then maybe even in the same situation. Like, and here's this high ranking <laughs> drug lord. <laughs> right. You've got all of these people in the same room. <laughs> They're brothers, like the the high ranking government official in the narcotics cartel. They're all brothers. They're all the same. He's our accountant. He's our meth dealer. Our Our meth dealer. Their biggest customers, though, were Mexico City's biggest drug cartels, who often came to Adolfo before smuggling runs or every time they had to engage in a turf war with another group. They would ask for his blessing and protection, wholeheartedly believing in his mystic powers and connection to the spiritual realm. So that's kind of cool. You guys get to promise cartel members that you're going to protect them. Whatever. I'll do it. It's like being somebody's oracle. You're like, yeah, you're going to do great in this war. And then like half your party dies. And they're like, well, you know. The other half didn't die. The spirits be funny sometimes. <laughs> yeah. You have to get really good at like coming up with what your readings are so that when shit like that happens, they can't hold you accountable. Because all you said was some of you will live. Yeah, it's like it's like horoscopes. Like they're just real vague. Yeah, yeah. super vague. Like fortune cookie. Mm-hmm. But hey, I mean, you have enough people believing it. it. Doesn't really matter if it's real or not. That's true. That's very true. And in fact, the more people that you get to believe you, the more true it becomes to them because they're like, oh well, all these other people believe it. So uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, obviously he's credible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Surrounded by dead cats and fake zebras. <laughs> in an article published in the Los Angeles Times, quote. Costanzo practiced his magic in Mexican high society, winning adherence with his ceremonies to drain away evil. And he took his religion born in the Congo and changed it to meet his own needs, including offering its protective spells to drug dealers. So is that a news article? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was from the Los Angeles Times. <laughs> oh, okay. It's, uh, yeah, it's just funny, like mentioning the drug cartels. Look at, what, look at the good he's doing for Mexican society. <laughs> oh. Adolfo was openly bisexual and had an endless stream of lovers, both male and female alike. They were all recruited to join his mystical organization, and before long, they were referring to Adolfo as El Padrino or the Godfather, which I think this might be a bit controversy, but I think this version of the Godfather would be maybe better than the original, you know? (laughs) Oh my gosh, yeah. Magic, necromancy. Hell yeah. yeah, this would be a great version of The Godfather. <laughs> it should be a predecessor All the of The Godfather. Cartels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah somebody yeah. should remake that now for the 21st century, and that's the story. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll make it. I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> so among these followers was this college student named Sarah Alderet. And she's got a wild name. So Sarah Maria Alderet Villarreal was born in 1964 to a middle-class family in Mataros, Mexico. The town was situated near the country's border with the United States, which meant it was easy for Sarah to attend high school and later university in Brownsville, Texas. At the Texas Southmost College, Sarah was known as an intelligent and athletic girl. She was a straight-A student who was also part of the school's cheerleading team. A tall brunette with an athletic build, she studied physical education with an intention of transferring to a larger university to earn a teaching certificate in the subject. Well-liked and high-regarded by her peers, Sarah seemed to be on her way to a comfortable and satisfying life. But underneath this veneer of perfection was a deep fascination with the occult and the Mexican drug trade. Interesting. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm picturing like, you know, because she's cheerleader, I'm picturing like Kim Possible theme and like her saying like cheerleading <laughs> practice by four and dangerous drug smuggling by five. <laughs> like, hey, everybody's got to have their hobbies, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> One of Sarah's former classmates, Antonio Zavaleta, said, quote, She sat in my anthropology class all semester, an A student, always present, always friendly. I never saw her wear an emblem, an amulet, a talisman, or any sign of black magic, and I am trained to watch for such things. Never heard her ask a weird question, even when we talked about weird religion, unquote. I'm not sure what he means by he was trained to watch for such things, because that seems like a weird thing. Trained to look who trained him. <laughs> Which sorcerer trained you? Like what agency is he affiliated with? <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah. what does that training entail? What, <laughs> what, what, which one of the houses is he with? Is he a, what are the <laughs> Hufflepuff? I don't I'm know enough Harry Potter lore. <laughs> Sounds like a Ravenclaw to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She lived a double life, a grade A college student by day and a witch by night. Every evening, Sarah would go home to her middle-class neighborhood in Matamoros, 
where she would kneel before a blood-splattered altar that she had erected in her bedroom before turning in for bed. There is no way in hell I could have had something like that in my room growing up. I would have seen that immediately. Good God. Also, where did the blood come from? Yeah. Whose who's blood you got smeared in your room? Do you That's know a good how bad question. that stains the carpets? She's probably half witch and she's got like a prime rib steak that she's used for the blood <laughs> or something. It's not even like a real animal or something. Throws it at her altar every night. <laughs> Close enough. Before Just bed. ground beef. She's got ground <laughs> beef on the altar. <laughs> <laughs> ground beef. Yum. This interest in the occult and in the drug trade was deepened even more when Sarah began to date Elio Hernandez Riviera the uncle of one of her classmates, Serfin Hernandez Garcia, and one of the region's top drug runners. The two men, Serafin and Elio, were part of the Hernandez clan, a large family who had made their fortune smuggling tons of marijuana across the border. So, <laughs> weird to date your friend's co- don't, uh, don't uncle. Don't date your friend's uncles. <laughs> don't do that. The uncle is always the creepy one, like always. in stories. You go to a barbecue, a family barbecue, and you know the uncle is the, is the weirdo. Yeah, and you guys could probably do an episode on this guy alone, I would imagine. He's a pretty pretty awful guy, which we'll get oh, into. God. According to the United Press International, their operations stretched from Mexico to Michigan, a massive sprawling drug empire headed by Elio's older brother, Saul Hernandez Riviera. So a lot of a lot of names were thrown around, but basically she's dating the brother of the head of a drug cartel in Mexico. When Saul Hernandez was assassinated in 1987, though, Elio emerged as the clan's new leader, which meant that Sarah became even more entrenched in the illegal drug trade. She was exposed to his vast network of cartel bosses, gangsters, hitmen, as well as clairvoyants from Mexico City. As the head of the Hernandez drug cartel, Elio often found himself in difficult and messy situations because, yeah, you're the head of a drug cartel. I don't know what you expect. Well, (laughs) messy situations. Like murdering people. Yeah, yeah. what do you? Because like a messy situation to me is like a traffic ticket. What is a uh, a messy situation for a uh, drug cartel? <laughs> so maybe that's his messy situation because he's used to the killing and stuff like that. He's like, oh, this is normal, but I hate doing my laundry. <laughs> I hate getting the blood out of it. <laughs> I don't know the tricks. What is it? Vinegar or something you use? I don't know. <laughs> Cold water. Cold water. Something Baking like that. Soda. Does anything truly remove blood? No, just time, I think. I don't. <laughs> or, or fire. Yes. Or fire. Yes, yes, very true. Whenever he found himself in messy situations, he turned to Adolfo, not just soulless, but also supernatural help and guidance. It wasn't long before the rest of his family followed suit, falling under the sway of Adolfo, whom they idolized and venerated. He became their unofficial spiritual leader, performing frequent animal sacrifices that he claimed were part of a ritual that ensured their safety and the smooth flow of their operations. Well, and he's helping the stray overpopulation situation (laughs) in Mexico, I I guess. I mean, I guess, but damn, what a way to go at it. Yeah, an optimistic way to look at it. (laughs) Positive light. Like maybe they're not starving to death. Maybe he's giving them a good home and feeding them and oh, murdering honey. them in sacrificial no. rituals. <laughs> no, that's not what's it happening makes me feel at better. all. I'm gonna go with no on that one. Yeah, yeah. he's uh, Damn it. he's just painting a bunch of horses to look like zebras and slaughtering them is what we've decided. Uh, yeah. This this organization is not run by PETA. <laughs> it's not what's happening well, to those animals. Maybe. Oh God, no. <laughs> Come to find out, that's how PETA keeps going. This ritual magic. That's why they get mad at the rest of us for killing animals. They need them all. They need True. them for their shit. To protect themselves the from evil. Yeah. Conspiracy. <laughs> also, it's really easy to sell a product that you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> like, it seems really easy to just be like, this is going to make your luck really good. And in reality, they're just doing well because they're killing the most. Yeah. Uh, he's like, none of that was all me. All me and my sorcery. You're welcome. Yeah, not your well-established drug trade. It's It was me, not, nothing else. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Later, the Chicago Tribune would report that, quote, Constanzo apparently told others that the sacrifices would act as a magical shield, protecting their operations from police and bullets. So he's just making wild claims. <laughs> I cast invulnerability. <laughs> Yeah, basically. Yeah. I cast shield and it's like, no, that's not, sorry, LARPing is not an actual thing. Instead of a card, it's a dead animal. Uh, I yeah. cast invulnerability. 
dead cat. Just throws a chicken at him. I like how that's the, how they activate their shields too. It's just like dead animal. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's it dead animal money dead animal shield. <laughs> and the promise of the lifelong success and security was enticing with this guarantee adolfo was able to wrap the hernandez drug cartel around his finger and adolfo's followers were all fanatics but none more so than sarah who was later said to be the most zealous and the most mysterious of them all some say that she and adolfo were involved romantically but this wasn't confirmed and you know Probably. It's probable, I would say. Oh, yeah. So it, it may be an open relationship yeah. that they all have. Could be. It could very well be. You never know what happens behind closed doors. <laughs> <laughs> or open doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. For others, though, she was just as bloodthirsty and as evil as he was, if not more. Sarah's really painted in a great light. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she went from, like, cheerleader, drug cartel, then witch? Potentially. What's well, better, it's the though? cheerleader part that makes not trust her. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the suspicious, that's the suspicious part. part of cheerleader. How do you have that much energy and be happy all the time? It's ridiculous. I know, I know you're neurotic, cheerleader. So you're hiding something <laughs> underneath there. I know it. Absolutely. Sarah was only 24 years old when she entered Adolfo's cult, but she quickly established herself as one of the organization's leaders. She was christened La Madarina, or the Godmother. And her relationship with Elio combined with her loyalty to Adolfo led to the latter taking over as the head of the Hernandez clan. That'd be a good prequel to the godfather of this, you know, movie franchise we're trying to build out, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we're just spitballing ideas. Just some ideas we could pitch to Netflix later on. Oh, yeah. They'll take mm-hmm. anything. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Especially now. I, I heard about cuties and I'm not on board with that. <laughs> Adolfo and his followers set up their base at Rancho Santa Elena, which was situated less than a mile from the border. It was owned by the Hernandez family, which meant that their activities were free from prying eyes of the neighbors and the local authorities. Before moving to Rancho Santa Elena, Adolfo had used old bones dug up from graves. However, he claimed that the spiritual protection offered by his rituals and the Nagana cauldron would be greater with live human sacrifices. So I think you can see where this is going. (laughs) Yeah. You couldn't, you didn't get enough from the grave robbing. You couldn't, that's not enough bones for you. You need more bones and they have to be fresh bones. Well, yeah. you know, like you gotta kill the people. Grave robbing too damn lazy for all these people to be doing. <laughs> you know, when you have like meat in the freezer for a while, it gets freezer burned. You, you want, you want that fresh meat. So <laughs> he's gotta go get it. Yeah. <laughs> The Hernandez clan members saw no reason to doubt their high priest and set to work abducting their rivals in the drug trade and corrupt cops who had reneged on their agreements with the cartel. So the cops are no longer corrupt. They're, they, they're like, they were corrupt <laughs> and then they were like, oh, never mind, we're not going to help you. And so now they're dead. Just because they reneged on their deal does not mean that they are no longer True. corrupt. That just means they're being corrupt with somebody else. <laughs> yeah, they could just be working for another cartel. <laughs> A hundred percent. I don't see many of them just being like, oh no, I'm too good for this. All right. <laughs> I've realized the wrongs I've done, how I'm changed. <laughs> so they brought these people back to the ranch where they were brutally tortured and slain. Adolfo would boil their remains in his nagana, creating a foul concoction that his followers would then drink. They would drink this shit. <laughs> mm. What a... Yummy. Yeah. What a wild... <laughs> Why would you... I don't Is that know. like bone broth? Does that have some of the same healing properties as all the bone broth bullshit I'm seeing everywhere? I haven't heard of that. You are on... I'm going to say no. Depths of Facebook I'm, I have not I'm seen. I'm going to say no. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, no, it's in the stores. It's in my grocery oh. stores where it's like chicken and beef bone broth. And it's like, it's amazing for, I don't know what, but something. Colds. It's it's all, it's all the old wives tale stuff. Where yeah. Like, oh, chicken broth oh. will fix your food. Oh, no, Campbell's has been taken over by a coven of witches and now they're just marketing oh. this bone broth. New conspiracy theory to add to the internet. <laughs> so they're drinking this this broth of, of people juice and bones. They do so in the belief that it would make them invisible and bulletproof which i think is ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> we're back we're back to the bulletproof shit like the two things you can easily misprove to yeah they're like, picking those. Yeah, that's what i'm saying one some of the people in their cartel have to have been shot right absolutely like they have to yeah. since he's been on on the payroll as their shield provider somebody's yeah. gotten shot so what's the excuse for you know well and do you need both 
Like if you're invisible, they can't see you to shoot you. And if the whole thing is that you just don't want to get shot, you don't need to be invisible. <laughs> Are you invisible to your comrades? Because uh, we can see you. Yeah, bro. that's exactly what I was. Yeah, they, they, they can. You can see them. Well, how do you think you're invisible to other people? I don't understand that. Like, Because if you're invisible and someone else is invisible, you can see each other. It's everyone oh, else that can't see you. That's how it works. <laughs> I see. Magic. I forgot about that. Or if you're not invisible to anybody but your enemies. <laughs> True. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to spin that, like in a way that like, oh, no, no, you won't be able to see that you're invisible. Only other people can. Right. But not the people here. Yeah. Other people. <laughs> Everyone else can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wild that uh, that they think this, but... Uh, Logic. Uh, so some of them even fashion necklaces and amulets from the bones and vertebrates of their victims. Wearing these whenever going on drug runs is like a good luck charm, I guess, like a rabbit's foot or something. <sighs> or it just scares the enemy because they're covered oh, in... That's what I'm bones. saying. That's intimidating. It's going to keep me up the fuck Freaking. away from somebody. <laughs> <Mm-mm>. <laughs> I'm be like, you know what? Put my gun down. I give up. Like, go I ahead, think that's now. a human toe. I'm just going to go now. <laughs> you can you can have the money. <laughs> all of this, all of this shit right here doesn't matter. I'll see you later. Yep. Actually, no, just never again. <laughs> don't don't follow me. I'm going past Michigan out of your range. So <laughs> please don't come after me. Yeah. Going to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think I got here? <laughs> yeah. I'm running from the cartel. <laughs> Elio was christened as the organization's executioner priest. So Elio married to Sarah, just to clear that up for everyone again. These also sound like character in like um, World of Warcraft, like Executioner Priest. Yeah, or, it's a great What do they name. call those? Uh, Priests? Classes? Druids? Classes, thank you. There we go, yeah. Oh, okay. Basic language skill. <laughs> Shows what a nerd I am. I just started going through the races instead of actually giving you the word you were looking for. Elio's chest and arms were branded with marks that Adolfo claimed were sacred. And this title was well-deserved because according to Texas Monthly, quote, Elio sent three of his men out to grab the first person they could find, who happened to be a 14-year-old boy looking for his lost goat. They threw a gunny sack over the boy's head and took him to Elio, who promptly decapitated the boy with a machete, never bothering to look at his face. After the headless body flopped across the floor, Elio was struck by something familiar. It was the boy's gray and green football jersey that was familiar to him. And terror flooded Elio's dark eyes as he reached for the gunny sack, as he had just executed his own nephew. Oh, yep. You a son of a yep. bitch. He probably killed his damn goat, too, that he was looking for. Poor kid. <laughs> they sacrificed wow, that last week. Wow, just don't even look. <laughs> don't even look. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. That's, that's karma. That is not for that kid. That's not karma for that kid, obviously. <laughs> that's karma. No. Him. Well, it depends which football team he was cheering no, for. No, but like seriously, how you, how do you go to your sister after that and be like, so what had happened was he was there? I don't know if they ever told the sister. It was kind of a secret, I think. <laughs> like he went missing. Yeah, he's gone. It happens. Found, found your goat, though. Found your goat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the important part. Yeah, exactly. That's also where the goat went. <laughs> But Adolfo's thirst for blood remained unsated by the drug dealers and dirty cops that they were sacrificing. In early March 1989, he once again claimed that the supernatural protection the Hernandez clan had been enjoying until then could be made even stronger if an Anglo male, a typical gringo, was to be sacrificed. I don't know what gringo means as a Canadian. What does that mean? (laughs) Is it just kind of slang for white man? It's slang for, for, well, for people who aren't native. Natives. Uh, yeah, of the area. So it's just like anybody who doesn't like know anything or doesn't speak Spanish or Portuguese or wherever the area is. That's I think that's just a slang. It sounds cool. Gringo. Yeah. Not in this sense. He's they're hunting gringos <laughs> now. So <laughs> uh, as it turned out, Mark James Kilroy of Santa Fe, Texas, was exactly the gringo they were looking for. Mark was a college student at the University of Texas in Austin, where he was studying to become a doctor. On March 10th, 1989, Mark traveled with three of his friends, Bill Huddleston, Bradley Moore, and Brent Martin, to South Padre Island, located on the coastal tip of Texas. The group planned to spend their days at the beach and their nights partying at one of the many nightclubs in town, a typical spring break vacation for any college student. During the next few days, Mark and his friends hit up practically every bar they could find, 
The wee hours of March 14th saw them on yet another drinking binge in the red light district of the border town Matamoros, accompanied by other intoxicated university students and revelers. This time they had selected a spot called Los Sombreros, which had the shortest line compared to the other nightclubs. However, this particular bar wasn't frequented for a (laughs) reason. Just a few months before in July 1988, the son of the owner of another nightclub had been involved in a shootout at the club with a man known as L. Dubby. Dubby? What, something like that. I like Dubby. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the most fearsome members of the Hernandez cartel. And his name's Dubby. Yeah, Dubby. Dubby. <laughs> Dubby. Good old Dubby. Good old Dubby. Hey, Dubby, what's up, Dubby? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a nickname for like a rubber Dubby or something. Yeah, that's true, true. <laughs> rubber Dubby. 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 Oh, Dubby. Or somebody can't um, pronounce Dobby's name from Harry Potter. Dubby. <laughs> it's my Dubby. Uh, I hope he's not alive. (laughs) At about two in the morning, the boys were all drunk and ready to call it a night. But when Bill returned from relieving himself, he was surprised to find the inebriated Brent and Bradley unaccompanied by Mark. Where did Mark go? Nowhere pleasant. (laughs) According to a dissertation later written by Victor Gomez, quote, Huddleston remembered seeing a man described as short with a bushy mustache and a fresh round type scar on his left cheek, motioning towards Mark. But he did not think much of it. He believed it was someone who Kilroy had met while bar hopping. After Huddleston returned, Mark Kilroy had mysteriously vanished. Although Mark's companions do not recall exactly what happened that night, it appears that the four of them were too intoxicated to recall, making it easy to take advantage of them. Oh, yeah. Bunch of drunk white guys on the town. (laughs) Never a good recipe Uh, for a good thing. So. Well, and I don't know, I don't know, because I haven't studied it, and A, I'm also not a man, but I don't know if guys look after one another quite to the same extent that women do when they're out drinking. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. I know somebody who went to uh, another country and partied too much and was on a work thing, and the rest of the people lost him. He lost his phone, and he was gone for the whole <laughs> night in an Asian country, unattended. No, guys don't look out for each other. Like, is that social Darwinism or something? Are people just letting kind of the, like, certain people in the group? As men, we're not as worried about, you know, being raped or kidnapped. So those are two main yeah. things that are why women look out for each other. Yeah. <laughs> so it is like a more, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. you know, you can handle yourself pretty much. Yeah, like you don't, there's not the same feeling of, like, need to yeah. like because yeah. like if I lose sight of Amanda at a bar like I worry and as you should as you <laughs> should I fall down and I get lost and yes yeah I know I know we've we've had many experiences <laughs> no but no it's just a thing we, ingrained in us from birth yeah, we're like just, pack animals watch out which is together. not great commentary on men towards women I guess is a moral of that story <laughs> I mean not all men no, no, and no, not no, all not, men no. it just the lower 10% that, <laughs> that makes a bad name for everyone. The lower 10%. <laughs> the bottom of the barrel? Yeah, those yeah. ones. <laughs> those ones. The guys on Tinder. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. It, no, any dating site. Oh, I could give you stories from Match.com oh, yeah. where I met my husband. <laughs> he was one of the good ones that didn't try to solicit things. So that's good. Yeah, I had quite a few on OkCupid, which is also where I met my husband. Lovely. I didn't realize there we both go. met our husbands on uh, dating websites. <laughs> oh, yeah. Efforts to locate Mark or his body were led by his parents, Jim and Helen, along with a slew of government authorities, including United States Customs Agent Oran Neck. Cameron County Sheriff Lieutenant George Gavido and Juan Benitez Alia, the head of the Mexican Federal Judicial Police Commandment. Oh my God, these names are so long. Just make them shorter, please. You are giving yourself some <laughs> real tough sentences. Holy. Get with the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, like I get it. You're you're a cop. You think you're important. Just use a shorter name, please. <laughs> <laughs> So the search lasted for weeks, aided by extensive reports from national media. Jim and Helen Kilroy offered 15000 reward for any information that would lead to their son's whereabouts. Despite the sizable sum, only hoaxes and false tips came in. As the search dried up, Agent Oren Neck and Sheriff Lieutenant George Gavito came under fire from their superiors, who wanted the two men to return to their former positions rather than focus all their efforts on the disappearance of Mark Kilroy. 
The publicity generated by the case, as well as the lack of leads and the breakthroughs, was ruining the reputation and image of local law enforcement agencies, which is why both were made to drop the search. Because what's more important, finding the person that's missing or your reputation? <laughs> yeah, reputation, of course. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Duh. I'd get those five-star Yelp reviews, guys. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Just when all hope seemed to be lost, though, one of Adolfo's cultists made a crucial mistake. Seraphin, who is Elio's nephew and Sarah's old classmate, ran through a routine roadblock on the afternoon of April 9th, 1989, perhaps in a belief that the concoction he had been drinking made him bulletproof and invisible to the authorities. So. <laughs> Does it make the car invisible? <laughs> no. Is it like Wonder no. Woman's oh, I jet? hope not. I hope that there's just no one driving. <laughs> I really want to see the person's face who thought they were invisible when they realized that they are not invisible or bulletproof. <laughs> <laughs> you can see me? And they're just baffled, baffled by the, the thought. <laughs> They probably believe it so strongly that they think the cops have some special bullets that can somehow affect bulletproof uh, people. Well, and, and I'm sure Adolfo has put that into their heads, too, that there are other opposing forces. Yeah. Because, you know, no religion is good without an opposing force. Yeah. So. A zebra blood dipped bullets that can pierce through invisible <laughs> invincibility, I guess. <laughs> However, he was very much visible and accidentally led the authorities to Rancho Santa Elena the center of the cartel's <laughs> smuggling operations. A search ensued which turned up 30 kilos of marijuana and other drug paraphernalia. The American Drug Enforcement Agencies and the Federales knew they had hit the jackpot. But for the superstitious Mexican cops, the ranch held secrets far more sinister than cannabis. So this guy's an idiot. He just led them all the back to the... How do you accidentally leave? I thought he was going to get like pulled over and spill the beans. I didn't know he literally just <laughs> led them to the place. <laughs> And it, does he still think he's invisible at this point? He's like, oh, they can't <laughs> see me. So he's driving off and taking them there. Well, obviously they're using their zebra blood dipped glasses. Oh, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It gives them 20, 20 sight on invisible people. It's a known fact. <laughs> it's such a weird belief. It's such a, it's such a physical belief. Yeah. To actually believe that you are invisible is such a physical belief that you have no like reinforcement of you're just like well he said it so <laughs> so it must be true it's true yeah. <laughs> jeez the police officers had spotted a storage shed that contained melted candles cigarette butts empty bottles and several greasy cauldrons proof that the spot had been used to worship the devil which i, I don't know if i would have drawn that direct <laughs> conclusion i would have been like oh they must have been partying or something like that but they're like, it must be the devil. Yeah. Fast food restaurants are filled with greasy cauldrons. And they're not like <laughs> worship places of the devil. So This is Wendy's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the American lawmen actually laughed off their concerns, but the commandment Juan Benitez was firmly on their side. He ordered the investigation to be called off, much to the distress of the Americans, until a local folk healer could be found to cleanse the site. <laughs> the minute... <laughs> The minute his rich ritual concluded, the search resumed. So they're like, hold on, we got to get this place blessed by a, by a, it. By a shaman. <laughs> oh, man. It's pretty funny to me to like, because so, so like the United States isn't heavily steeped in any kind of culture, just by nature <laughs> no, we got of how culture. old we are and everything. So for no like, <laughs> we, have, we have a culture, <laughs> <laughs> but for for the belief to be so inundated into the politics, the police, the local government, like that's, that's yeah. a deep, deep belief for cops to call off an investigation because they feel superstitiously threatened is, is a pretty, pretty wild, a, a pretty major yeah. call. Yeah. 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 Well, and that might speak to why, if the culture yeah. itself is that immersed in spirituality and the supernatural, then it would be natural for him to be able to convince so many people that he is this practitioner of whatever, the voodoo, voodoo. <laughs> the godfather. Some necromancy. Yeah, yeah the godfather. Weird shit going on over here. Yeah. Greasy cauldrons. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's very true. It's, it's already ingrained, so it's not much of a jump to go, hey, I can do magic yeah. for you. Like. It wouldn't be that unusual. It's it'd be mm. like for us in America having a like the faith healings that people yes. believe in and stuff. Exactly. Like if you think about that, and such a big subset of the population that 
believes in that. Or even modern day like conspiracy theories, which is like leading to leaders who believe in these conspiracy theories to become empowered. <laughs> so it, it's very much like it's the same thing. Mm. It's, they're all <laughs> they're all just different kinds of cults, you know. It's just history repeating itself <laughs> over and over and over again. <laughs> you went on here in georgia now no we don't yes we do oh oh, yeah no i'm sorry i blocked that out of my memory 47 ar-15 i don't freaking know what she poses with in those photos but it's ridiculous (laughs) how's canada (laughs) Uh, how's anywhere but here yeah it's okay (laughs) better off i'd say it's (laughs) beautiful and it's great they don't want us all to just suddenly storm the (laughs) They won't let us. Canada does not want us. I know. Yeah. I've been trying. I've been trying, but Ew. no one will adopt me and my husband and our three <laughs> Just move to Manitoba. No one will even know. There's there's tons of room there. <laughs> no, you don't want to live there. But uh, sorry, Manitoba. <laughs> it's like not that part of Canada. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the ranch caretakers came forward and identified Mark from the photograph that had been shown to him saying that he'd seen the boy handcuffed in the back of a Suburban in the property's equipment yard. Meanwhile, in a Matamoros jail cell, Leo and Serafin, who had been among the four suspects arrested at the ranch, confessed to kidnapping Mark and witnessing his ritual sacrifice. So Mark's dead. Pretty pretty much we knew that already, but it's confirmed. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think as soon as anybody from this cult laid their hands on him, it was, it was over. Yeah. So according to Texas Monthly, Seraphin told investigators that he had buried Mark and he led the way to Mark's grave, which was marked by a piece of wire sticking out of the ground. On the other end of the wire had been attached to Mark's spinal column so that when his body decomposed, members of the cult could pull up the vertebrae to make a necklace. So that's where the, ne- the necklace is. <laughs> like a little easy access oh string they've got. Uh, I'm mad that they came up with like a, a quick way to like get the bones yeah, out after they've been doing it, it for a while them. when you got it down to that level of like streamlined yeah. you'll look out into the field and it's just like a ton of wires sticking out of the ground <laughs> <laughs> oh ooh, I don't like that <laughs> also who was the person who had to tie the wire onto his vertebrae <laughs> excuse me that's their arts and crafts section of the yeah the weird shed with the it was probably Sarah yeah. Cauldron. It was That's Sarah. Probably. It was the cheerleader. That's what the, the women did. did They're members. Yeah. The well, oh, they do was, the laundry and the crafts. She was kind of the one of the second in command. I, I think. I don't know if she was doing too much of the laundry, but, uh, <laughs> you know, feminism and all that. <laughs> <laughs> when Mark's body was uncovered, Commandant noticed that his legs had been cut off above the knees and asked Seraphin if that was part of the ritual. No, Seraphin said. It just made him easier to bury. Pretty straight to the point. That's rude. <laughs> yeah, but then, oh, I guess they just pop the legs in there on top of the rest of the body. I thought, like, I thought, didn't they have to, like, cook them or something? So now they're just, they just, did they, eat they just kill people and they just <laughs> bury them in the ground and wait for their bones to come out. Yeah. They've gotten really efficient with this. Yeah, I don't know. So well, and they can boil it down. Also, how would that make it easier? Like, you could lie them flat and it would just be the same amount. Of, like, I wouldn't be much harder. I <laughs> know I can't. I don't it understand just, his logic. Is he burying them vertically? <laughs> we didn't have to dig as deep. I'm like, why are you standing him up? Yeah, why are you stupid about this when you're good at everything else? No, this guy was the same moron that led them all there, so he's oh, not the brightest true. guy in the show. Oh, he probably was oh. burying them, like, standing straight up then. It probably, you know what? He probably was told one time that it had, like, they, as a joke by one of the other cartel people to like, yeah, you have to bury people with, you know, their feet pointing down, standing up. That's the only way that their souls can come up and souls have to shield dig us out or whatever. After you bury just, them. Yeah. Yeah. So now he just does it every time. They just have him around for their amusement so they can play yes, pranks so just on watch him. him dig really deep like graves. <laughs> yeah. He has to paint the zebra horses. They, they tell him that's how they get their stripes. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of feel bad for this guy. He's kind of an idiot. I feel he a might have bit, uh, a little bit. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not too bad. I guess I, I thought I'm about like, it. Eh. Yeah, he killed a lot of he people. He was dumb. <laughs> you know, he was a yeah. dumb, horrible person. <laughs> <laughs> no mercy. I have no mercy. With Seraphin and Elio in custody, the final pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Gradually, the entire turn of events, from Mark's disappearance to his eventual murder, came to light. So going back to the night of March 14th, 20-year-old Seraphin had been surveying the rowdy spring break crowd, trying to spot 
the Anglo male that Adolfo had bade him to bring back for another ritual sacrifice. Seraphin had embraced the Palo Mayombe religion only a few months before in a bid to please his uncle. However, he hadn't known that he would be tasked with kidnapping people so that they could be used as sacrifices to the gods. Still, he couldn't deny that it had brought a slew of good fortune. The cartel's marijuana smuggling business had boomed while his grades at the law enforcement major <laughs> at, at Texas Southmost College had skyrocketed. So this dude was going to be a law enforcement. He's accrediting his grades to ritual sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, He's like, not the yeah, study. No, it's really gross, but my grades got really good. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the marijuana sales probably would have just boomed anyway if this was yes. like 80s and Drunk 90s in the Mexican US. Drug 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 drug. Yes. Hell yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's not the magic, buddy. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I personally wonder what his grades where he's like, oh, I got a C. That's good for me. Like this guy is. Yeah, he was failing. He's not failing anymore. Like, <laughs> and I shouldn't say this. What are law enforcement classes anyway? Ooh. I actually took some. So. Yeah. Okay. Are they... It's mostly fitness. And... Well, that's what I thought. Like, I feel it like does... it's I mean, a lot of fitness. I, I guess it depends on what what kind of law enforcement. Because, I mean, I have like a and associates in criminal justice, but it's mostly just like law and stuff like that. Not so it's like, depends on if he was like at the beginning of the stages, he's just learning about like, you know, although I don't know really why any of the places that are teaching this in the area would bother teaching law because it doesn't seem to matter. (laughs) So, and he's already family with the cartel. So I don't see. Yeah. The reason his grades went up was probably because his uncle like paid somebody and was like, look, I know he's stupid, but, you know, he wants to be in law, you know, a police officer. So just, in, in, you know, indulge him. He wants to be a corrupt cop. It's his dream. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. And I guess technically being in college, learning law enforcement, you're not technically hired by a police force yet. So it's not quite as bad, but he's on the track being there and... <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think I don't think anybody either. who's like studying law enforcement should be like, you know, corrupt or anything. I think that's part of the problem we already yeah. have. It's like maybe we should reel that back a little and make the adherence <laughs> a little stricter on the curriculum. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Due to these uh, these good fortunes happening, when Seraphin eyes landed on the intoxicated Mark Kilroy, there was no hesitation to be had. He successfully grabbed the university student and wrestled him into their pickup truck. Approximately 12 hours after he'd been abducted, Mark finally came face to face with Adolfo. Adolfo and his followers wrapped duct tape over Mark's eyes and mouth before guiding him through a shed. It would have smelled putrid, like rotting meat after the many human sacrifices that had already been carried out before him. Which, by this point, from the apartment in Florida, Adolfo's probably just used to this by now. This is just... (laughs) Used to the smell. He revels in this. Maybe even better if there's no feces in there anymore. Yeah, maybe now it just smells like blood and dead decomposing <laughs> bodies. I know that. I'm not sure which smells worse, decomposing flesh or feces. Mm. They they kind of smell the same probably. It's a toss-up. Awesome. We'll do a Twitter poll. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Blood and shit or decomposition? <laughs> As with, with all others who had lost their life at the hand of Adolfo and his loyal followers, Mark was cruelly slain. His body parts were left to boil in the Nagana, the broth consumed by the cultists, who wholeheartedly believed that they were being made indestructible by the remains of the young American. So how many years had they been doing this to gain invisibility and bulletproofness now and somehow hadn't determined that this isn't working? (laughs) Like uh, I, their circle sounds a little too small for me. I mean, let's 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 out. be honest. Like we just recently did, like you know, Heaven's Gate and and stuff like that. Cult leaders are pretty good at getting people to believe shit. the shit that they're Anything. that they're selling. Unfortunately, they tend to be like very charismatic. And then if you already have this I'm faith, just, that's I'm surprised one of them wasn't drunk one night and wasn't like. Hey, let's shoot each other and see if this works. Well, like, I'm just very surprised. You're probably not bulletproof if you're shot by one of your own. It's only against mm-hmm. enemies. Uh, there are so many caveats that you can put on on any kind of, like, invisible force that you're promising to give. Okay. And he's like, oh, well, it doesn't yeah. work in that scenario. I'm sorry. Exactly. Just like how American voting only works when certain people win. <laughs> yes. If I didn't win, then it's not real. It's only correct if the outcome is a certain 
person, certain giant orange potato being reelected mm-hmm. to the president. Don't worry, he'll run again in 2024. I will not comment. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, we can. <laughs> Serafin Hernandez Garcia was made to dig up the land in the ranch. For hours, he worked under the hot sun and at gunpoint. By mid-afternoon, he had uncovered over a dozen corpses, all of whom bore the cult's brutal mutilation. So this is after everything's happened. They made him dig up the graves, I guess. Just him. Just him. So like the authorities are making him dig it up at gunpoint? Yeah, the authorities are making him dig up all the... They're like, well, you buried a bunch of people. Now you're going to dig them up. Now he's going to dig his freaking seven foot holes. Well, they're probably also heckling him for how he buried them too. If he did do it, feet up. Yeah, you idiot. This would be way easier if you dug them vertic- or horizontally. <laughs> it's interesting to me that the guy who only started like a couple of months ago is the one who's being forced at gunpoint to dig up all the <laughs> bodies from this morbid religion. Yeah, this guy gets all the shit. He, does. <laughs> he gets all the he shit. Really he does. really does. The news caused a frenzy, especially in the town surrounding Matamoros, the majority of which contained families or two who were still desperately searching for answers of missing peoples. They crowded around the ranch and the funeral home trying to identify their loved ones amid the sea of mangled bodies. Many of them had traveled hundreds of miles coming from their mountain villages and far-flung communities, bolstered by the hope of justice and, more importantly, closure. Among the identified bodies was that of 14-year-old Jose Luis, uh, Luis Garcia, who had vanished on February 25th, just a few weeks before Mark Kilroy had disappeared. Unlike Mark, though, Jose Luis did not come from a well-off family, which is why no search parties and press conferences were held on his behalf. His parents couldn't even afford to buy a body bag for him to be buried in. His sister said to reporters, he had no head. She had been the one to identify the body which had been decapitated, which was also missing its lungs and brains. She then said, it was chopped off on the side, but I knew it was him by the shirt he was wearing. It was gray and green, his favorite football shirt. Um, so yeah, so this is the, the nephew of the guy of the, uh, whatever his yeah. stupid name was, Elio. Elio. I was trying to think of his uh, nickname. Also, so they're, they're eating, they're consuming human brains. Uh, they're at least removing them. Yeah. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Well, that adds like a whole nother layer of how this crazy may have, cause we, we have learned that, you know, eating the human brain, yeah. the protein brain. kind of puts holes in your brain. So Makes sense. But it also makes you invisible. So, trade I, mean, off. I don't know. I guess if there's holes in your brain, you would think you were invisible. <laughs> Maybe that's why this guy was an idiot. Yeah. He just, he hadn't learned object permanence. You could just cover his eyes and he's like, I'm invisible. <laughs> if I can't see, no one else can see. Exactly. <laughs> that's like toddler logic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the young boy's parents, Isidero and Ericada, were far from enraged, though. According to Texas Monthly, they seemed relieved and even at peace even going so far as to thank Mark and his family. Ericata Garcia said, if it weren't for the Kilroy boy, none of the other men, including my son, would have ever been found. She said to a reporter from the Brownsville Herald, which is not the take I would, I would be so pissed. <laughs> God, I'd be mad. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, I mean, if he's been missing for like a long time, a lot of times just not knowing is way, way worse than, you know, just That's imagining true. what they could be currently. They could be alive, could yeah. be suffering. You know, so I imagine it's just a relief to have any kind of answer, even if it's not. And they're thinking Mark. They're not thinking like the people who murder right. him. Yeah, true. I guess that's true. <laughs> true. Which happens to be their some sort of cousin or uncle or something like that. So yeah, he killed his nephew, and it, wait, the the sister's poor, and like it just seems very like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearly, they didn't communicate with that part of the family very much, and maybe the maybe the family did so. Because of this reason. Probably. They're probably yeah. like, we don't want to have anything to do with you. You need a freaking yes. yeah. eating people's bones and stuff. We don't like it. Well, and it's, <laughs> you know, of course it took a white boy to bring investigation to this. To yeah. Happen oh, yeah. With this. Well, because his parents had money to expend to make it happen. Make it happen. Yeah. Because yeah. before they were just, yeah, targeting poor villagers or corrupt cops which mm-hmm. in mexico i don't know if corrupt cops going missing no i doubt yeah. anybody cared they were just like oh dave <laughs> didn't show up for work weird yeah i don't think it's uncommon for mexican boys and girls to go missing and they do nothing about it yeah. it's almost something that's just an accepted it's happened a lot actually there have been many uh, yes. instances the of... girls it's mm-hmm. the girls of i yeah, can't the think lost of the name girls of a certain of... village yeah lost girls the lost girls yeah it's it's um 
I think it's a border city, isn't it? It's a border city with like, um, it's just a lot of girls went missing and it was many, many, many years before anything was ever like brought to light about it. Hmm. It happens a lot. Well, that's terrible. Make the Mexican border like the Canadian border. Much nice. No. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Much, much less uh, smuggling, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Just no guns. That's it. Just no guns. <laughs> yeah, I don't know Mexican gun laws, I guess. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I don't know. I've never been to the Canadian border. I don't know. I know. I don't know enough about the border. I know everyone's always bitching about it and wants to reinforce <laughs> it with freaking walls and fortified No, not the Canadian shit, border. But... They don't want to put a wall on the Canadian border. No, I know, but the Mexican <laughs> border. Like, I don't know anything about... Well, I don't know. I thought that there was a joke. There was a South Park about Canada putting up a border to keep Americans out once Trump oh, got elected. That is a joke that we make, yes. <laughs> I mean, hey, fair joke. Can't blame you. <laughs> and we'll make America pay for it, because that's how it works, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how yeah. yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. While all this is happening, the manhunt was still underway for Adolfo and the rest of his followers, who had managed to escape in the raid. Because they were invisible. <laughs> <laughs> or because they took their sweet ass time checking the premises with the shaman. Yeah. Well, they only had the one guy at gunpoint. Meanwhile, they're just all <laughs> scrambling, getting their shit together and like heading out on their zebra, their fake zebras. They're also invisible because they drink it too. Exactly. Everyone's invisible. <laughs> so an abandoned safe house uncovered some of Sarah's clothes which led authorities to mistakenly believe that she had also been a victim of the cult's vicious rituals. None of them could have ever imagined she was actually its perpetrator and one of the most zealous adherents. adherents. I mean, that's they never discover female serial killers and stuff because they're like, oh, a woman couldn't have done that. <laughs> and that's sex is in the other way. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. They're just like, oh, yeah, a woman yeah. couldn't do that. Like, no, they're not capable of such things. Yeah, dumb. It is dumb. Women are horrible. It's just as horrible as everyone else. It's just... just the ten percent, the bottom of the barrel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the bottom of the barrel. They are equally as bad as the men are. I just, I say, you know, humans are bad in general. Mm-hmm. True. We've just been taught to do it in this backhanded, passive aggressive <laughs> ways <laughs> instead of the violence. Mm-hmm. Three weeks after the discovery of the bodies at the ranch. Local authorities were able to track down the remaining cult members surrounding the building where they were hiding. Adolfo became enraged, firing his machine gun and throwing bundles of money out the window. The Godfather! <laughs> like the Godfather. He's the Godfather. Yeah. He's, the Godfather. He's just missing yeah. a pound of cocaine. The, the story's writing itself. <laughs> it is. So is he trying to like say, okay, I'm going to either kill you or take all this money and leave? Like, is he just trying both yeah. at the same time? Like, Or he's got holes in his brain from eating other people's brains, and he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. <laughs> just... Yep. Yeah. Realizing that all hope was lost, he ordered one of his followers, a cartel member named El Dubby, to sacrifice him and his lover, Martin Quintana Rodriguez, to their gods. After a moment's hesitation, El Dubby compi- uh, complied and fired the machine gun, instantly killing the two men. Minutes later, law enforcement stormed the room and the surviving members of the Matamoros cult, including Sarah Alderette, surrendered. The reign of bloody satanic terror was finally over. The locals considered the the ranch to be a bastion of black magic, the very place where the devil dwelled. On a Sunday afternoon, law enforcement slipped inside the property and headed to the shed, accompanied by a shaman. Salt was sprinkled on the floor, incantations were mumbled, and the sign of the cross was made. Then gasoline was poured all over the shed and it was burned to the ground, erasing the tangible (laughs) remnants of the Matamoros cult for good. As you said, the only way to get rid of blood, fire. (laughs) Fire, yeah. Cleanse it with fire. I just, it's funny to me that they went in there and sprinkled salt first and then they were like, "Mm -hmm. all right, now burn it down. Burn it. Throw a match. All of it. Get rid of it. Yeah. (laughs) Like, why even bless it first? Just burn it. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a religious person, so I'm not sure. What the uh neither am I. I couldn't I couldn't comment, yeah. I guess. <laughs> well what I want I've always wondered what happens if you get the incantation wrong. Oh, then the devil just pops up out of the ground. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I could be a spirit like a faith healer or any a shaman or a witch because I'd be summoning the wrong shit because I can't even get my words out correctly <laughs> half the time. Especially because like all incantations and stuff are often in like freaking Latin and shit. It's like, I don't know how to pronounce that. Yeah. <laughs> There's no chance I'm getting that right. 
I'll be, I'll summon like a Papa John delivery or something instead. Like, I mean, I'd be okay with that. But. It's, it's your State Farm agent. <laughs> like a good We've been trying to State Farm is your extended warranty. Yeah. <laughs> In conclusion, the Matamoros cult has been a source of fascination for many years. Thanks in part to how their activities blended together folk mysticism, superstition, and drugs. Mexico has always been associated with the intersection between Christianity and the ancient indigenous religions, which give birth to practices that involve magic spells, amulets, potions, and shamans. In this country, magic is alive, which is also means that the line between the human realm and the devil is often perceived to be blurred and even non-existent. These beliefs were even more widespread in Mexico during the 80s, and it was common to see strings of garlic and pepper as well as white candles adorned in office spaces, residential areas, and even public places. These were items that were used to ward off evil, something that nearly everyone in the country was interested in, from peasants to celebrities and even to the gangsters who belonged to the nation's most fearsome drug cartels. Perhaps this is the reason why the Hernandez clan fell underneath the spell of the high priestess, Adolfo Constanzo, They were willing to do whatever it took to keep their business operating and their family members alive, even if it meant mutilating and sacrificing innocent humans to seal the deals with the devil. And that's all. So (laughs) thoughts, questions, comments, concerns. That's a very interesting one. I really, I'd never heard of that, uh, that particular cult, but it's very interesting just how deeply ingrained into like the whole area it was. It's not just, you know, A lot of times it's just a cult of just, you know, 500 people or whatever who believe something. But for it to be an entire area is, it's a lot of reach. Kind of baffling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and like I'd heard of Mark Kilroy. So I think that's how I'd heard of this cult is from seeing some article about him or his disappearance. But I hadn't dug deep into the the story or anything. But yeah. I don't know. It's it's interesting (laughs) to me, like you were saying, how the members of the cult are so loyal to each other and so supportive i don't know if they were supportive but how they're <laughs> not to that one guy <laughs> seraphin yeah oh. not to the one the guy having to dig all the holes and bury everybody but like how they can have this kind of weird sense of loyalty and family mm-hmm. and moral code kind of within themselves and then just go around murdering people well, like yeah, in the name of religion like but still lack of regard for human life but only certain human life because you know anybody that's in your religion no you're cool everybody else sucks it's just and that's like a bit of like the propaganda right like the same thing with war like any war you go fight against another country it's the same thing you paint them as the bad guy and you're okay with that morally even though a lot of people who go to war are good people but they just get convinced that that person's trying to kill you and your family so go kill them first so it's the same idea it's true which is our weakness as a species, I guess. So, <laughs> <laughs> And this is why it'll happen again and again and again. Well, and we yep. follow authority too much in some situations and has led to terrible things. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, too. Yay. Uh, yay. <laughs> I don't know what the happy, uh, you know, ending is to this, but <laughs> but uh, they were caught, which is a good thing. They're, they're, yeah. they're not around yeah. anymore. I mean, there's Mexican cartels still, obviously, but... Oh, yeah. Well, those families got closure. Yeah, with the Mexican cartels. I mean, until there's a huge societal shift and the police aren't corrupt anymore and the economy is stabilized and there's probably just all of these different things that have to happen. So that's a lot of ands. It's a hard thing to overturn. (laughs) Well, it... It's it's something about it sustaining their culture and their economy, probably. But... Yeah, so that's the uh, that's the Matamoros cult. I, I appreciate you guys <laughs> listening to that. Uh, I'd like to thank again yeah. Laura and Amanda for coming on once again. They're the Terrible People Doing Terrible Things podcast. If you want to give a shout out, give some plugs. Feel free. Awesome. We're terrible people doing terrible things, as Josh said, and we enjoy covering pretty much what it sounds like (laughs) bad people (laughs) who've done some bad things so you'll get your serial killers we talk about cults a little bit we covered mother Teresa for our first episode (laughs) um they're kind of just all over the place yeah we don't really know what we want it's just we cover everything the mother (laughs) Teresa Teresa episode was was a great first episode that's a wild one to come out swinging with I like that (laughs) right (laughs) 
That's what my mom said. Yes. <laughs> she was like, you go with Mother Teresa for your first Like, your we're first going episode. with Mother Teresa, damn it. I was like, do it. <laughs> go no one's expecting home. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey. So yeah, definitely go check them out. Uh, once again, they're Terrible People Doing Terrible Things podcast. Great podcast and definitely give uh, give Laura and Amanda your, your listening. Your listens? Your listeners. Your listens. I can't your pronounce listen. words. Your ears. Uh, <laughs> your ears. Give us your ears and your, your time and your yeah, exactly. subscription. <laughs> I don't know. So thanks for coming again, guys. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. All right. Well, until next time, we'll see you guys later. Bye, Fred. Bye.